anniversary and uh -huh. he'd like to see me tonight. All right. <laughs> it's really not true. We, we just didn't have any tonight. So <laughs> I tried to tell him that, right? <laughs> well, we began today with students returning to schools and it was actually a great day. Every school that I went into and I know that Chuck and Brad and Dia, Eric, Andy, Heidi, Jenny, all, we were in all of our schools, and every secretary I talked to said it was the smoothest start they've ever had. And we've worked a lot of years trying to get families to sign up early with the registration process, and it's starting to work. And, and so that helps that process without having a lot of families there and trying to get registered because they already have. And, and so that felt really good today. Keith and I started at Southview and we, we saw kids jumping and running to greet other friends and twirling around. They were so <laughs> excited to be back. We wished we had that much energy to start the day. Absolutely. And so I know many of you were at our buildings today greeting folks, so thank you for that. And I wanna give a shout out to Ball State and our community volunteers. We had a tremendous amount of people that wanted to welcome our students back. And we were, Keith and I were also very fortunate to be joined by President Mearns and Jennifer, his wife. Mm -hmm. and, and so we are grateful that they took time to, to greet our students. Yesterday, we had our opening day um, celebration with our teachers, and we were able to announce our district teacher of the year. Um, Andrew Hacker, who works at Northview and does a tremendous job, is the district teacher of the year for our elementary um, folks. And then Chris Horner, who works out of the MAC, he was identified as the teacher of the year for secondary. Now, if you remember when we did teacher compensation, that is when you identified we really want to reward our most outstanding teachers. And so they will see um, all teachers of the year received an additional $1,000 to their base salary, but our teachers of the year for the district received another $1,000 more. So they'll have an increase of $2,000. And they do an amazing job and it's really well deserved. So thank you for that. Well, Friday night we had the band competition and our band worked, as Chuck said, 300 plus hours this summer and wonderful leaders, including Chuck Reynolds, who's out there and his wife supporting the band all the time. And we put on a remarkable performance um, throughout the year, we always were just like a hair behind Kokomo. So every competition, it was like a half a point to a point behind them. So I always think of like a ball game. And if you think you lose by a point, that's terrible. It's so close. And so we were very proud that we received second place, one point behind first place. I looked at the rankings. And then after that, it really dropped by quite a few points. So we were neck and neck the entire time with Kokomo. So that just challenges us next year to, to continue, and but everybody should be extremely proud. Uh, our Muncie Central High School football stadium, the dedication is August 25th at 6.30. I know all of you have been invited, but I want our community to know that we would love for them to join us at that football game and to celebrate you know, our new stadium. Speaking of Muncie Central High School, we are experiencing a, you know, a little bit of congestion. Morning's not as bad. Afternoon, it, it, was, it was pretty hairy this afternoon, but we'll keep working through that. There's just high traffic exiting after school because we have one of our entrances blocked in preparation for the Y project that's going to be going on. We've experienced this when we, we um, did renovation at East Washington Academy and at Southview, when you're going through it, just like if you're having a renovation in your house, it's not fun when you're going through it, but the end result is always worth it. And so um, we'll continue working to, to try to get some relief and to get that traffic flow going a little bit faster than what it was today. And the, um, lastly, I've heard just from a few folks that we've had a few um, bus 
issues regarding um, either not, not having routes established for them or hearing that they may have a route and they, they may not be attending our schools. So we worked with Auxilio today, our IT team, and we have a, a fix. Um, it's going to take, you know, we'll, we'll keep working through it, but I know that's going to be resolved. And Auxilio is working extremely hard to make sure that we have that taken care of. It didn't impact very many people, but if it impacts one person, we don't like that. So we're working to make sure that we have that taken care of. But overall, I would say we had a great beginning of the school year. That is great. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, public comments, there are none today. Nobody signed up. And so we'll move on to our consent agenda. Do we have any questions or comments on any items on the consent agenda? If not, I entertain a motion. Moved to approve. Second. It's moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Moving right along, the actionable items. Uh, purple star for Northside Middle School. Is that Chuck? Yes, I, 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 I can help out with that. So <laughs> it, it's a, a really a resolution um, uh, asking for a, a resolution from the board to recognize um, Northside Middle School as a, a Purple Star um, school in recognition of um, our military families and um, uh, students that have that have served, um, and, and this is uh, a recognition that Ben has brought forth um, just as a way to to honor those that have served um, and and do serve in our in our district and our families that serve in our district. Um, if you recall, last year Ben puts on a Ben and his team put on a marvelous Veterans Day mm -hmm. program, and mm -hmm. I think this is just another piece of of wanting to to recognize our families. Okay, great. And, and I would say our high school Central already has that recognition That's right. That's right. that um, Bob Harbor with the ROTC applied to the state, and we've received that already at Central. That's great. What is so, that? I mean, so is there? something that it's on, on our on their website is it yep yeah so there's uh stuff on the website they have to put a display up in the yep. school like central has a display right there outside the rotc room so they'll put a military display up um they have to host an annual veterans day conference which they already do um and then they have to give veterans and their immediate family members a chance to job interview if positions are available as part of it so so this is an opportunity that will just be passed on to the next class and the next class and the next class mm -hmm. wonderful mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you all right do we have a motion so moved second moved and seconded all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed same sign motion carries all right mr Derome. thank you Included in your board packet is our uh, permission to advertise budget presentation. We do this every year about this time. Uh, we do this to follow the state guidelines and to follow statute on the, the actual timetable. So tonight we're, is considered the permission to advertise meeting. We'll do the budget hearing on August 22nd, which just becomes a public hearing for the public to make any comments on the budget. And budget adoption will be September 12th. The whole budget process is pretty much an 18 month process of where we have been, where we are now, where we expect to go. Um, basically, you're just trying to establish your total spending for the calendar year uh, 2024. You're establishing uh, the, the caps or the limits on spending, and it helps establish the tax rate and the local property taxes that will be collected for the public. Um, that particular slide up there, I suppose at some point I can probably uh, take it uh, take it out of the group there. But for the last, this is the sixth year now, uh, we've switched to the new way, which is only these funds of education fund, operation, and debt service fund. For those with a long, long memory, it used to be considered the general fund and capital project fund and, and transportation fund. Now we just have three buckets of spending, and it's all under those three categories, education, operation, and debt service. Uh, I'll just give you a brief 
uh, definition of what the education fund is again. The education fund is almost all your spending that you have in a school building. So if you think of a particular elementary school or think of a middle school or a high school, all the spending in that particular school is pretty much for education fund. It's the direct instruction of the students and it includes the principals, instructional assistants, anything related to curriculum or technology. It does not include the utility charges or the maintenance or cleaning such as that. For our particular budget, we're going to advertise an education fund budget of about 39.4 million. That's just slightly up over our budget the previous year, this current year of 2023, which was 36.7. The reason we're making it go up just a bit is because we're getting more revenue from the state. If you get more revenue from the state, you have to ask for more appropriation to spend it. Um, we also, I'm just giving you this heads up, uh, we, we continue to transfer money from the education fund to the operation fund, and that's the permitted transfer up to 15%, and that'll be 6.8 million that does not count towards that 39 million. I tried to give you a big blue pie chart here, or big pie chart. The big takeaway from this education fund, uh, big pie chart, if you will, is salaries and benefits make up 76% of all the spending. So if you've got, a, in this particular case, like I said, $46 million in this total pie, uh, salaries and benefits are 76%. The transfer to the operation fund, that's another 15%. And then the rest of it's very small, the state loan payback and the supply. So you can see uh, salaries for teachers and the benefits, that's, the, that's your main thing in the education fund. And that's pretty consistent with really how the, the former general fund was too. So I just wanted to show you that in a visual. Uh, a brief definition of the operation fund. The operation fund is almost like, well, what do you have in an administration office? You have the administration, plus we also pay for uh, transportation with buses, utility charges, maintenance and custodial items. That's as well as any buses we would want to replace. That makes up the operation fund. And we, I wanted to show you basically the trend there. In 2022, that approved uh, operation fund budget was 12.6 million. This year it was cut to 10.2 million because of the increase on the tax caps. This next year I'm advertising a little bit higher, 11.9 million, which is about the highest I think I can go. Um, and that's just really because of the, uh, the tax caps continue to limit how much we can spend in the operation fund. So the tax cap this year uh, is expected to be about 10.8 million. And what that means is again, if, if the gross levy that we're going to collect from the local taxpayers is a little over 22 million, uh, the tax cap is going to chop off about 10.8, and we're only going to receive about 11 million of property taxes for uh, our debt service payment or our operation fund. And that's how that's how that works. So, hey, what? Brad, Brad, I have yes. a quick question. I'm sorry, since okay. you're on that slide. Do you know the logic behind pulling out salaries for administration as opposed to putting in an education fund with all other salaries? Well, we, we follow what they want us to what do. What they want yeah, us to do, right. but I, it seems... Right. That's... Yeah. Um, administration, they say, well, it has to be an operation. Um, direct education... Now, and you, so that's one thing. That. I've already started conversations with our General Assembly, okay. and, I've, and they actually didn't realize that... You, that the, so this is something that's been carried over from a long time ago. And I said, I am in schools and dealing with academics more than even operations. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, right. And so I said, right. you know, as we're trying to find relief for our, our operations fund, yeah. right. I said that would be an easy way that yes. it wouldn't even cost them any more money. No. And so I've started working on that. We'll, we'll hope I'll have a little success. Well, that's why I asked, because yes. it yeah. would relieve us a little bit. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's that's fine. And really, the um, that's what makes up the operation fund. I did also did a pie chart for operation fund, and that's a lot of colors. That It's like a big, giant... Uh, uh, I had a previous uh, school board member that always called the uh, capital project fund like a big, giant cookie jar of so many different things, and that's really what operation fund is. You'll see the big blue section is really for maintenance and cleaning services with maintenance and custodial, that's the SSC contract. Transportation costs is the red 
uh, down on the bottom, that's about another 28%. The green section over there is utilities, and then you see slivers of other costs of the business office, the admin office, insurance and workers' comp for the property and casualty insurance, and that makes up some of those other slivers. But it doesn't take long for, in this case, $11.9 to be chopped up. And security is in this also, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. So the next slide after that just kind of shows the trend on what's happened to operation fund. And like I said, it's not that Brad DeRome is a great cost cutter. Uh, we had to cut it because they did it. They did it to us. It's not up to me. The DLGF cuts the budget for us. That's why you advertise high and they will cut it. And that's what they do. And that's what they did here. Because believe me, I, this past year, you can see 2023, it says 10.2 million. The year before, we were 12.6. Well, they cut that to fit under the proper uh, tax caps and such. So then we have to live with it. Mm -hmm. We have to live with the 10.2. So the way we have lived with it this year, we've obviously had to live with it by also spending out of rainy day to help offset uh, some of these expenditures that normally would have been in operation. Because you could see, you know, the big picture of the previous four years there, it's always been over 13 million, 13.7, 13.9, 13.12.6. Uh, that's a trend we knew was happening because the, the tax caps kept increasing. So you can see the far bar on the right, 2024, we're trying to project just a little bit of an increase on the uh, operation fund. The Brad, next slide Brad, just, Brad, yes. That's not unique to us. No. <laughs> it, it, but but we, it, it, am I right in assuming that it, it hits us harder because of a lack of uh, industrial tax base. That is that is correct. I, I do not have I do not have the chart included in the budget presentation. I do have uh, a report that I was given by our Baker Tilly consultants. We are number six in the state of Indiana in terms of tax cap loss. Uh, we used to be in the top five or top three uh, by by us <coughs> lose, losing ten point eight million. Uh, Gary was number one. IPS was number two. Uh, number three, I think, was uh, was Wayne Wayne Township in Indianapolis. Uh, Anderson was in the top ten. Um, uh, and, and some, and most of those districts you're talking about have have referendum that now they're bringing in. That, so this, but then they have the money they bring in from referendum that can support right. this. And and so I would say if you look at the ones who are extremely tight with this budget. You know, th this this is it for us. This we is don't a reason. have another source. Because when you think about that, when I say, oh, we've had a $10 million uh, reduction in property taxes because of the tax cap, that's $10 million I, I cannot spend in that operation fund to help me towards roofs, doors, and floor, upkeep mm -hmm. of the building, technology, you name it. There's a, a domino effect to that. So that's why we've had to do building projects. We got the free money from Essers to help us with those building projects. Mm -hmm. We've done some really short two-year paybacks on these uh, uh, succeeding bond projects that we're doing at Muncie Central because those were paying them back in like two years' time because that's what our financial consultants have recommended to us to try to counteract this reduction in the operation fund because it's just uh, we don't have a lot of room for anything extra out of the operation fund. We really don't. So, And that's, that's really what we're living in right now. So next, the next slide just explains what's debt service. Well, that's your long-term debt. That's what our long-term debt is for the school district. Um, it's, it's supported by the local tax rate, uh, the local taxpayers, uh, it goes into that. Just to give you a brief trend, uh, our debt service payments in 22 was 5.1 million. This particular year, it was nine and a half million plus uh, the way the DLGF uh, had me do the budget. Uh, they made me apply for the additional appropriation because we're spending $12.3 million this year in our debt service payments, uh, which also included the payoff of the 2014 GEO bonds. So this is kind of a rare year. 2023, that's huge balloon payments of $7 million that we had to pay because that's the way those debts and bonds were structured. The 2014 GEO bonds, that's one of the first things I looked at when I got here five years ago, was can we restructure those? Can we refinance those? And the answer was a big fat no. You could not. Because <laughs> usually that's what you do. You try to restructure it, refinance it, spread it out. 
those could not be done that way. So we just had to know this was going to come. So that's why it looks like it's so large. So this will float downward a bit in the next few years. So that's why we're only advertising next year for debt service payments of 10.8. And the DLGF is not going to give you a dollar more than what your actual debt service payments are because you have to provide to them all your uh, debt service payment amortization schedules and make sure it, it's in, they're comfortable with that. So we'll, we'll get whatever we have asked for for that. Um, so that's, that's really what your debt service is. Um, the next graph, it just shows where's that debt service lie. Um, that's a total principal outstanding for this, this. This was as of June 30th, 2023. That's 26.1 million of outstanding debt service debt. Uh, a year ago at this time, it was just a little over 25 million. So what's happened in the last year, we, we took on the, the 2022 lease rental debt, and that was about 5.8 million. And you can see your first blue bar down there on the left, and now it's down to 3.7 because we've got those on like two year payback. So it's, we're, we put the debt on and we're taking it off in about two years. So that just represents uh, the outstanding debt. So obviously the goal is to keep, keep going down. We're paying it off per the, per the debt service amortization schedule. Uh, the, the next slide just, just talks about the definition um, the capital project plan and the bus replacement plan, even though they don't live on as bus replacement funds like they used to, they've never cleaned up the language, so we are still required to have a capital project plan and a bus replacement plan, even though it's embedded inside the operation fund. So in order to comply with requirements, uh, I'm just going to explain to you that uh, our capital, capital projects plan spending for a building, for roof stores and floors, items that were those types of expenditures for uh, bugs flying around here, um, make up about 2.8 million. Uh, I don't have any specific projects identified because items such as utility costs, uh, there's nothing identified as a major project. Any major projects we do, as we've explained, we did it out of ESSER funds or we've done it out of selling bonds. So that's, that's how we'll continue to do that for the capital project plan. The bus replacement plan, it's the same way. It's embedded inside the operation fund, but we still have to uh, talk about it. Uh, we have six white activity buses. They are all very, what I would call 2007 to 2010. So they're getting to the end or close to the end of their useful life. All the yellow buses are owned by Auxilio, but we own the white activity buses. Those are used for field trips. Uh, short-term sporting events, uh, golf team, wrestling team, robotics team, whatever. Um, so that's not a, big, not a big fleet of them, and we are trying to start replacing them, as we'll do that a little bit later tonight. We'll have a separate resolution to ask for a purchase of a, a white activity bus with a lift on it. But anyway, uh, bus replacement plan, it's paid out of operation fund. Let, let, me, let me point out, in case you guys didn't see that, lead time. Yes. We deal with this in Crazy. one state 12 to 24 months, mm -hmm. if you can get it in 24 mm -hmm. months. They laughed at me when I was trying to buy a bus. I thought I could, I've had this request to buy a special ed lift bus, and I thought I could just go to the three or four dealers in Indiana, follow the state bid list, yeah. but, which establishes the minimum price, so you don't have to, I don't have to bid this and just buy it, and just buy it off the shelf, if you will, like you would a car or truck, and boy... I even submitted that to my operation fund uh, uh, group that I'm in with all the, the, the individuals down around Indianapolis and those school districts, and they said, good luck, you'll never find one. They'll say you wait one year to two years. So the point be, you got to re be really strategic <laughs> about replacing your buses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's no used market in them. And I've looked, all, I've looked nationwide on cars.com, and what you get into is, Different states have different rules. Usually they're junk or they're high miles, and um, that's, that's not been our answer, unfortunately. So we're going to try. That's way, and we have federal funds available to buy a bus. We don't have to finance it or anything like that or take it out of the operation fund to buy it. So, Okay, tax rate, how we advertise versus our actual rate. 
We advertise high, we know they're going to cut it, and that's pretty much what we're doing here. We're gonna advertise operation fund at 85 cents, we'll advertise debt service at $1.39. So we're advertising at 224. Last year, or the year we're in, we advertised at 245. The actual tax rate's $1.20, so it's gonna be chopped right down in half. We know that, that's how the DLGF has us do it. The next slide just explains the process of why we advertise high. We do it because the DLGF tells us to do it that way. Once you, your budget is advertised, it can never be raised, only cut. So that's why you always advertise way higher, which is counterintuitive to the private sector or counterintuitive to when I worked at a steel company, you would, your budget should reflect what you expect to do. School finance is not that way. So you advertise high knowing they're going to cut it and that's how we do it. Uh, I just put a brief comment there about assessed valuation of property. When you think about it, uh, if you have a pie chart of taxpayers and there's less taxpayers, they're still maybe paying for the same city services. So if your economic activity in your community or tax base shrinks, the remaining taxpayers have to pay more. So they would have to pay a higher tax rate to get the same level of services. So in other words, the tax rate goes up and if you have less, less taxpayers. So that's why we advertise high. Um, if your assessed valuation in your district goes up, the tax rate will go down. If your assessed valuation of property goes down, the tax rate would go up. So that means you have less taxpayers paying for the levy. So that's why you don't want to see economic decline. You want to see economic activity you want to see more assessed valuation with more, more economic activity, more taxpayers paying for the services that your community offers. So anyway, one last comment about the tax caps. This is what drives those tax caps that we talked about of almost $11 million for us. Uh, as a homeowner, we all like not to pay any more than we have to. Uh, it's a 1% market value cap if you're a homeowner. 2% cap for agriculture and some other residential properties, 3% cap for all others. So that's what drives it. And if you don't have a lot of economic activity or economic growth, these tax caps have been embedded in the law since 2009, I believe. So that's that's what's driving so, it. I mean, they're actually in the Constitution. Yeah, it's in the Constitution. So we're not... Uh, we're just living with it, and I'm just reporting how that, how that particular thing works. Uh, the next slide there, it just talks about we're going to advertise a property tax levy of $36 million. The actual levy this year, we, we received about $22.7 million, and the tax cap subtracted $10.8 million, so you're going to receive a little over $11 million in property taxes. That's how this works. Just because you advertise it doesn't mean you're going to get it, okay? So that's just, um, and we expect the tax cap, once again, to still be around $11 million this next year. Um, I just put some education fund assumptions up there. Um, the one thing that drives your revenue uh, in the education fund, the education fund is not based on property taxes. It's based on enrollment. Okay, and it's like that for every public school district in Indiana. Our education fund is based on the school funding formula, um, based on our actual enrollment that we'll have in, uh, now it's October 1st and February used to be September, second Friday in September, it used to be in the fall. Uh, right now, on the, they give us a guesstimated formula this past summer. Uh, that fiscal year basic grant will be about 44.9 million. Uh, I kind of put it through a little uh, calculation to try to convert that to a, a calendar year. It's still gonna be over 44 million. Uh, so that's where we're getting our state basic grant plus some other revenue. We say we'll be a little over 46 million in revenue. Um, so with the, uh, the transfer in there, we're still going to be in a surplus position. We expect our ending cash balance at the end of uh, perhaps December 24 to be over $18 million, and that can fluctuate based on how much uh, money or transfer we might want to put into rainy day if we're afforded that opportunity in December of 23 or December of 24. So we're going to be still in a, a surplus position and so your, your one big takeaway as a school board is, are we trending in the right direction? Yes, we're still trending in the correct direction, uh, being in a surplus position. Um, 
it's always tenuous as we, we talk about the operation fund. But for, for right now, the education fund, we're still, we're still hanging in there, and that's what you want to know. So operation fund, just the brief comment about that, as I've already mentioned, it's about um, the operation fund will advertise a little over 11 million, 11.9. We'll still do the transfer of 6.8 million. I just kind of broke that down between the general fund spending, uh, capital equipment spending, transportation spending. No matter how you slice it, the total will still be 11.9 million is what we're asking for. That's only a slight growth. Um, the next slide just summarizes the total spending uh, that we're asking for. Um, you can see that total spending we're asking for is just a little over $62 million, $62.1 million of the education fund, debt service fund, and operation fund. Um, I put a little star, or a little beside the levy on the operation fund there, 13.7. That is as high as we're allowed to uh, advertise it because they tell you what the cap is. And our cap for 2024 is 13 million seven oh seven and that's calculated statewide it's a four percent increase statewide so whatever your levy was for property taxes and operation fund in 2023 you multiply by 1.04 percent and don't ask me how they do that it's a combination of uh state income and uh, what they tell us the last year it was a little over five percent this year it's four percent um so they're allowing you to boost your levy 4% in operation fund. But if you have tax caps, that can offset that. So anyway, just wanted to mention that. The next slide is just a brief summary of, once again, we're going to advertise a budget, a tax rate of $2.24. Don't panic. Last year we advertised at 2.44. The tax rate's probably going to be closer to this year, which it was $1.20. Uh, our Baker Tilly consultants are trying to keep us right at 50 cents on the debt service tax rate. That's what. That's why I've always come to you and said, they've told me we're going to be tax neutral. They've told me I'm going to be tax neutral when we do these bond projects like at Muncie Central. And that's what we're trying to stick to, that we add some bond debt, but then we pay it off so quickly, we're trying to not make the tax uh, rate go up. So that's that's what we're trying to do there. Um, that's, that's a strategic initiative we're actually trying to stick with. Uh, the next couple graphs, it just shows the trend of the education fund. Um, you want to be above the line. That's the point. Uh, <laughs> you want to be in the surplus position. Obviously, since 2017 there, we've been above the line. You see the big negative there, and that was real back in 2016. Uh, but we're showing a trend in the positive. And if you're wondering why that's fluctuated so much from 2018, 19, 20, 21, and so forth, I could have made that higher, but I transferred money out of that into rainy day. So that was, that was once again, a, a, strate a strategic decision made. I could have made the cash flow higher on education fund, but we've, we've moved money to rainy day, and we've still managed almost a, a $16 million cash balance in education fund. Uh, the next graph just shows your cash balance in your education fund, which has continued to, to go positive. As you can see clear on the far right, it's almost 18 million on the far right. So we're trending the correct direction. That's, that's what you want to know as a board. Uh, we're going the right direction in terms of the trend. Uh, the next graph I wanted to show you, those are your property taxes we're collecting. So even if you can't read the number, you can see it's been fairly consistent. Clear on the far right is 2022. So these are all actual numbers. It was 10.8 million on the very last year there, actual property taxes collected in 2022. And really from 2018 through 2022, it's just been a little over 10 million. That's it. That's all we're actually collecting. Not sure what happened on the big spike there in 2017 when it was a little over 14 million, but I'm not sure we'll ever get back to there with those tax caps have continued to grow about about a half a million dollars a year. The tax cap keeps keeps growing. So that's just for your illustration to see. Uh, we don't collect 22 million, even though the levy is at 22 million. We only re really receive about 10, a little over 10.8 million. Uh, I wanted to show you the graph. 
Uh, this was the state loan, the state loan balance. It started out at 12 million, and you can see it's rapidly declining, which is good. We're paying it off per the, uh, the state uh, amortization schedule. Uh, it starts to uh, pick up just a bit in the last half of 2024, in the last half of next year's budget year. Uh, it's, it's been at 50,000 a month for about the last year and a half, and it starts going to 150,000 a month in July of 24. So we're gonna right now, because it's no interest, um, no one has come up with any good reason why I should pay it back early. So Baker Tilly consultants uh, have said, you know, it's not in your debt service. It's not, it's not affecting our tax rate. So right now we're just following the amortization schedule. It's deducted out of our state basic grant and the education fund. The next graph, and I'm almost done here, is the student enrollment. Once again, we're just showing the trend. Even if you can't read the numbers, it shows the trend. I've tried to post here February and September, February and September. Um, so the, the last one on the far right, that's the guess, that's a guesstimate right there where her little cursor is. That's 4680, 4680. Right there in the year before, September of 23 is about 4790. So um, we've been fairly consistent. It's not drastically gone down. It's not falling off the table. So. I don't have any preliminary figure or number to give you about today. You know, we won't know that officially uh, until back in October 1st. So we'll have plenty of time to get that finalized for our fall enrollment. So that is the enrollment chart. Um, ultimately here, um, I've tried to give you a, a brief picture of where we're, where we're at, where we're going. Um, um, ultimately here, I'm just asking permission for the board to advertise this. Uh, certainly entertain any questions. You've been great at asking questions along the way anyway, but. Uh, I, I um, do have a quick question about yes. the rainy day fund. Is there a maximum amount that you can have in the rainy day fund? There's no maximum amount you can have in the fund. There is a maximum of what you're allowed to transfer each year. Each year. Okay. So each year, um, about three years ago, I only, I transferred up to the maximum, which was, um, we transferred about 5.7 million, which was up to, I think it was the 15 or 20% of that year's budget, because you can't go over that education, whatever the limit was. I, I took it right to the limit of what we could transfer. Um, there's just, they obviously don't want you putting all your money in rainy day if you're not meeting your obligations in the other yeah. funds, so. And there are limited, I mean, there really are not very many restrictions on how we can use that money, correct? No, I basically, the restriction is only how we uh, define the rainy day fund. And what we have done, uh, I've taken you the resolution every time we put money in it when we make the transfer, usually at the end of the calendar year, basically saying uh, anything that for what we have done, it's defined as uh, normal operational funding sp spending, um, emergency items, capital project type of spending, building use, uh, things like that. That covers us broadly. So yeah. Right, broadly. Yeah. Flexibility. We have flexibility. Yeah, good. We don't use it for payroll, okay? Right. We don't use rainy day for that. I mean, and nor do we define it as such. Uh, we've tried to just use it for those offsets against operation yeah. fund. The point is it's strategically used for the best value of the community. Right. Mm -hmm. right. system. Thank you. But just a couple comments that I had, and, and the first one is more express. Yeah. appreciation on behalf of the board. I think that the entire team has done a masterful job of managing through this and the challenges with the operations fund. Uh, uh, you know, we're concerned about it, but I sleep well at night mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're ahead of the curve and we're not yeah. reacting to a crisis. Mm -hmm. right. And I, I so appreciate that and I know we all do. Uh, also, I think Kind of going to a comment, I think that Dr. K, you made earlier some some uh, things that you talked to legislators mm -hmm. about, and and again, I the state's been good to us and it has made things. So I don't want this to be a criticism, mm -hmm. but the the funding mechanism with property taxes is is not equitable. Mm -hmm. We are hurt in a couple reasons mm -hmm. because of the structure of the economy and the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We lost, and also because of the not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. 
wonderful institution that mm -hmm. we have in Ball State and Ivy Tech that benefits the entire state and benefits us with income taxes and other things. I'm not trying to say it doesn't, mm -hmm. it really does. Mm -hmm. We're much better off to have it, but it would be nice if there was a recognition mm -hmm. that it does hurt us in terms of property taxes mm -hmm. and property taxes is what funds things mm -hmm. like the operations right. budget. And if there can be a discussion about somehow an equitable solution to that, mm -hmm. I, I think we would all support that. Uh, and again, it's not a criticism, but it's a reality. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at a, a major commercial property like the Muncie Mall, if it, mm -hmm. whatever happens, it, it's just not equitable. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Ball State is huge, hugely valued, mm -hmm. but it's not assessed valuation that mm -hmm. helps us with that. So if there was some way to recognize those, and, and it's not just us, you mentioned Gary Anderson. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's other localities. And I suspect even some of the bedroom communities of Indianapolis face that because right. the residential cap is so low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though there may be wealthy communities, mm -hmm. there may be some inequities there, I mm -hmm. suspect because you hear fishers from time to time mm -hmm. and some of those saying, we need help. Mm -hmm. And I, your presentation helps me understand that. Well, and, uh, and it's really not part of the budget process, but it's part of our strategic plan financial piece that I've been working with uh, Baker Tilly and I've explained to them how I've had to handle and manage the operation fund with the rainy day fund. And as they point out to me, uh, that's not sustainable back in uh, back about five or more years down the road. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not going to work for me to keep trying to manage the operation fund and rainy day almost simultaneously because eventually I won't have enough money to transfer into rainy day to make this happen. So, uh, so they're giving us the heads up. We know that, um, that, you know, four or five years out, this is going to be a challenge. Okay. Because by then your rainy day fund is gone. And, um, by then you're still, uh, you're just about to finish paying for your state loan and you're still left with uh, big tax cap losses. So that's, that's probably the next wave of things. Um, we'll deal with a few more years down the road, but uh, we're, they're giving us a heads up and we know it. We know it's a heads up because we're seeing that. Um, to your point, if we're seeing a 50% reduction, is there some algorithm or something that could be placed in there that says mm -hmm. you lost doesn't have to go below 35% or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. How they make up the difference, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. There has to be a funding mechanism right. in place to do that, but particularly for those localities that have losses in industry, which is the driving force. Yeah. We, we worked last year to try to get, in the budget year, to get a special line item for districts hardest hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was in there until the 11th hour, and then it got pulled out. But oh, it would have been great because it, it would have benefited us about a little over three and three and a half million. And that's exactly about what we were looking for to close that gap. So, and so I do know some people recognize that, but we just have to do it, you know, keep trying to share information and having everybody get on board to try to help districts out. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that. Um, are there and you may not have the answer to this, but. Um, are there conflicting priorities that would cause anybody not to be able to see what seems to be obvious as far as? Well, I would just say, you know, you have elected officials and often they are looking after their community and not thinking about statewide, right? And so they're, they're elected by their constituents to, um, you know, to, to focus on their, their area. And so that's where sometimes I see we have some conflict. Hmm. Wow. So, well, we any motion to approve this? We, we do. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to very quickly echo uh, what Mark said. I mean, it takes time going through all this, you know, and we go through it often, so to speak, but I appreciate it a lot because you're doing just a fabulous job and it makes us feel, or at least that makes me feel very good that it's in good hands and we're gonna be okay. I think Brad could go on the road and do conferences on how to manage budget for school systems and mm -hmm. do a wonderful job. So, yeah. Absolutely. As long as you get back Not to work gonna, on time. Yeah. <laughs> we certainly don't want to. <laughs> 
said, don't be late. <laughs> Sorry, don't give me ideas. <laughs> I'd move to approve if there's no other questions or comments. So move. Second. It's moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Activity bus. Yeah, we kind of talked about this earlier, but this is really permission to approve a purchase order of an activity bus with a special ed lift with a potential 12 to 24 month lead time paid for by money we already have in place, but you literally can't find them. So this is the way we're doing it. Uh, we're asking permission to make this purchase and uh, that's what we're asking for tonight. So. And that seems like a high number, but one of our shuttle buses in Wall State costs half. Five hundred million dollars. Oh, wow! So, five hundred thousand, maybe. Five hundred, five hundred, five hundred thousand. I'm sorry. Five hundred thousand. Five hundred million is a lot. Yeah, we have two of them, so you can imagine what it's like trying to manage all that. Just a question: um, How much money do we have for that bus? How much money would we have in that fund? Yeah, over six hundred eighty thousand. Should we? try to buy two I mean should we um, I mean give I mean given that lead time I mean you you know what we we certainly could if you authorize that tonight I certainly ordered two well I mean what's the status I mean those funds are going to be there they're going to be what's, there and what's the status of our other buses because I think I think <laughs> you know Jim Jim's right the, stra the, the strategic yeah. replacement if we have the funding that's there you know it, it, it you know it would be good to to, to, if we have six of them and we can replace two of them every other year, you know, right. we're going to have a, we're going to have a. And the point is, they're going to get more expensive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I again, I'm not trying to. So, so the the funds that we're using are the Medicaid funds that we bring in, and so, um, you know, it, it's taken us a while to build up for, to that. Sure. So, sure. we certainly could do two. But then thinking two years we'd be able to do two more may not be the case. But we certainly could use two. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, we have the funding it, it, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and still leaves funds in that, mm -hmm. money in that funds. Because I, mm -hmm. I assume we can use those funds for other things also. Mm -hmm. Oh, correct. It's, and, and it's unrestricted. To, and need to, mm -hmm. probably. Yes. But, you know, 123 <laughs> times two is going to put us at uh, you know $250,000. Mm -hmm. Right still should leave mm -hmm. about 400 in there. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, I I mean, I, I just think the supply chain could get us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the other one, if it doesn't have a lift on it, does it have, would, would the other one have to have a lift on it also? Well, not necessarily. Uh, that, well, it that, may be a little cheaper, as I would It may be a little cheaper, could right. Be, yeah. and, and I did double check on that. And specifically, this would be a small enough yet bus that it would still be a operator's license to drive it. You don't need a CDL. It's not um, a special license to drive because of air brakes. It's still regular brakes like you'd have on a regular um, uh, passenger car. Um, so you don't need a CDL to drive it, just an operator's license. So it would still work with our district. Mm -hmm. And so there, but there are definitions and restrictions on how you, we can use this money. It's an un unrestricted. Unrestricted. It's unrestricted. Oh, so it is fully unrestricted. It's unrestricted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, it's just a question that, you know, I rely on you guys to decide mm -hmm. whether think you think so. that. Mm -hmm. Just change the motion to two. Mm -hmm. yeah. I that would sounds great that to motion. me. I'd make that motion. Second. Up to two. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we will uh, order two of these buses. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, the ayes have it. Great. No policy updates. Any other dialogue? I would say that I, my daughter's a junior this year, and so she was driving to school, and it was, although you said it was hairy this afternoon, while it was a lot of traffic, I would say that people out there controlling it did a really good job of keeping Great. irate parents, drivers, and other community <laughs> folks. Irate. And it was really, it went really well. Great. So. That's, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So, second. Okay. Moved in second. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.